from the Alex Trebek stage at Sony Picture Studios, this is Inside Jeopardy! Hello and welcome back to Inside Jeopardy! Your exclusive and official podcast destination for all things happening in the world of Jeopardy! I'm Sarah Foss, and I'm joined today by Buzzy Cohen. Hello, Sarah. Thanks to the miracle of technology, oh, yes. time, space have been overcome, and I am actually joining you today from beautiful Copacabana Beach in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Oh, boy. It looks a lot like our podcast studio, but it's amazing how but can- Jeopardy podcast production versus airing the quantum realm. Yeah, We're exactly. all in one place at once. And you can hear, once again, the rolling waves, the the calling seagulls, the, the faint hint of samba drums in the background. I'm just, just saying all of this to challenge our producers to create a sonic landscape, but uh, I've just celebrated New Year's Eve on Copacabana Beach, which is one of those once-in-a-lifetime Things. Sarah, how did you celebrate your New Year's? Well, it was a little less eventful, Buzzy. <laughs> Palm Desert, my mom, my dad, my husband, my kids. We did the nine o'clock New Year's. I, like I don't that. know if as yep. a parent you've done that, but <laughs> like, have. hey, everybody, it's East Coast New Year's on the West Coast. So I we, actually we counted it down early and. 2023 is off to a, a banging beginning. I enjoy a desert New Year's because I'm a dog owner and there are a lot of fireworks in the city of Los Angeles, but. No fireworks no out fireworks in, the in the desert. No fireworks in the desert. For those of you who are dog owners looking for somewhere to go with your dog for New Year's, don't go to Palm Springs because then I won't be able to rent. This uh, just so. in from Buzzy, the <laughs> travel coordinator. Yes. There you go. Well, thanks for uh, joining us from Rio or from right across from me here in the podcast studio, wherever we want to say that you are. You know, we've got another week of games to discuss with Ray Lalonde, who last week made it to Super champion status. I can't believe I get to say that again within a season. And just a reminder, Celebrity Jeopardy returns this Thursday with Michael Sarah, Brianne Howie, and Zoe Chow competing in a quarterfinal game. And for our Jeopardy fans who also enjoy The Chase, I'm on that show along with some of our other friends like James Holtower and Brad Rutter. Also on Thursday night, a little bit later in the evening. Yes, a 10 o'clock time slot for The Chase. <laughs> Trivia after dark. 8 p.m. for Celebrity Jeopardy. If you love Jeopardy, if you love Buzzy, I mean, <laughs> your Thursday night is made. Yes. Let's just say that. And later in today's episode, you'll hear the rest of my conversation with Sarah and Jimmy from the Clue Crew days. So make sure you stick around for that. But first, let's get into these games. All right. Well, we opened the week with Ray Lalonde going for his eighth win. Hard to believe he's already up to seven wins, going for number eight against Sarah Schmier and Bobby Fadis. Well, once again, this game really felt like the Ray show. Wasn't a runaway, but such a strong game, and he just put it away in final, never in question. I thought this was a tough finale uh, with TV finales. Uh, (laughs) In a reunion over 40 years in the making, Dolly Parton appeared as an angel named Agnes in the final episode of this comedy in 2022. Correct response, Grace and Frankie. Ray ended up getting this correct, but he really hesitated. We saw him write H-A-N. He thought Dolly Parton, godmother, he was going for Hannah Montana. Uh, Thankfully, he corrected himself because had he not, Sarah would have been our champion. I think I got this one right because Dolly Parton, 9 to 5, so that was her 9 to 5 co-stars. And I think I had just listened to the uh, Dolly Parton's America podcast, and they talked a lot about her relationship with those two co-stars. You never know where those Jeopardy nuggets are going to be found. You never know. You never know. All right, well, moving on to Tuesday, Ray Lalonde going up against Maggie Frank Shu and Scott Handelman. Well, Scott really made us think he was going to you know, make a move here, coming out strong in the Jeopardy round, but Ray just ran away with it in double Jeopardy and didn't have to play, but was able to put even more money for a $35,800 win. Final Jeopardy category, of course. Children's book, Ray already did well on that with the Charlotte's Web clue. Once again, all three players got it. Great clue about the Velveteen Rabbit. Yeah, and now Ray is a nine-time champion. We head into Wednesday. He's hoping for that 10th win and becoming a super champ. We had to kind of figure out, when do we call someone a super champion? It's when they win more games than I won. Yes, that. That's how we decided. Or double digits. We decided once you hit 10 or more than Buzzy Cohen. Yep. That's when you're a super champion. But Buzzy, you are a super champion in my heart. Just know that. But in this game, Ray is going up against Omkar Bot and Jamie Fletcher. This game was all Ray all day. Finished the Jeopardy round with $10,600. That's a lot of money to put in the bank in the Jeopardy round. And another 
far and away a runaway. Yeah, unfortunately, those incorrect daily doubles in double jeopardy from both Omkar and Jamie, you know, it just allowed Ray to have an even higher total going into final and just uncatchable. Yeah, and one thing I will say about uh, Ray, you can see it in these this game stats, very good about not buzzing in and having incorrect responses. That can be the difference between a runaway and just going into the lead, and I think one of the things that players learn as they play is to kind of, they can hold back. They don't have to guess at everything. Um, and Ray showing a lot of restraint here and it shows with that runaway. Yeah. I think you start having more confidence in your buzzer timing. Yeah. When I've played in rehearsal games, I'm terrible at the buzzer. I think I've said that. And so I just end up bringing in on everything, just trying to even see if I can get in first. It rarely happens, but clearly Ray, he knows he you've can get never, in when he wants you've to. You've never brought this up before, Sarah. When do you when do you get to play a rehearsal game? Oh, it's been years now. But back in the day, you know, Jimmy would always have he'd be hosting the rehearsals, but right. the other clue crew members weren't really busy either. So they would call us up to be the stand in contestants for right. you so know, like, like, like when at you're Radio in City DC, Music yeah. Hall or for the college championships when we used to be on the road. So we would be lucky enough to ah. to go in and play and I am a terrible buzzer ringer. There's got to be footage yeah. of those games somewhere, and we can get that and play that on it, release that on the internet. Oh, boy. If, if people haven't had enough of the Clue Crew in your interview, <laughs> let's get some more behind-the-scenes footage. All right. Well, we're heading into Thursday with Ray Lalonde going against Emily Kowaler and Rachel Cohen. Well, Thursday has always been my favorite day of the week, and this was quite a game. Ray in third place yes. after missing that daily double. Yeah, in we the don't Jeopardy often round. see him in third after the Jeopardy round, but that's where he found himself. Made it back. Pretty strong double Jeopardy round, but in second place going into final. And uh, hats off to Emily and Rachel. You know, I, I know that you have uh, the ear of the person who makes the decision, but this kind of felt like that Matt Amodio. Jonathan Fisher. Yes. Jessica Stevens game. A little bit. I a mean, I know bit. it's not quite, but but just how incredibly close it is. Yeah. When you head into Final Jeopardy and all three players have five digits, that's the sign of a really well-played game. And they're all within, you know, $3,000 of each other. Uh, really, really impressive. Yes. That's a Final Jeopardy. Gods and goddesses, each morning she began her ride in her chariot across the sky ahead of her brother Sol or Helios. Hmm. Yep, she's going to be thinking about Eos for a long time. A long time. Because long Emily time. would have been a giant killer. She yes. would have taken down Ray had she just gotten Final Jeopardy correct. I'm certainly thinking we could see her back in second chance, but we have to again see how the rest of the season wraps up. Right now we're wrapping up the week and the year with Ray Lalonde going up against Kristen Jacobson and Isaac Rabini. Well, Ray is back in form in this Jeopardy round and finishes really strong with 22,800. And it's shocking, but Isaac's daily double uh, makes it so this is a very close game. These are very strong scores. And even, you know, because of how close Isaac is to Ray, it keeps Kristen involved as a, a threat. And it wouldn't be a New Year's celebration if we didn't have a special category. In yep. this case, Memorable New Year's Eve. Ryan Seacrest obviously hosted New Year's Rock and Eve over the weekend. Yeah. And he gave some fun clues about memorable New Year's in history. Ryan is a busy, busy man. And so even just to be able to get time with him to record this category, it was tricky. But he's efficient. We found the time. And he helped us ring in the New Year with that category. All three of our contestants got that final on U.S. Bodies of Water. What a classic category title, you know, Bodies yeah. of Water. Yeah. This really takes you back. Um, all three of them <laughs> got it, and Ray finishes with an astounding 42,800. You know, on another day, Kristen Jacobson's 21,200. That's third place today. That's a winning score four days of the week on this show in general. So three great players, and what a way to finish. Yeah, and now Ray year. Lalonde, he gets to be a, a champion for two years, a Jeopardy champion for two years. Incredible. I had a chance to catch up with him right after that 12th win to see how he felt about the challenging week that he just survived. Take a listen. Ray Lalonde, 12-day Jeopardy champion. Can you even believe this? No, not yet. It doesn't feel real, but uh, here I am. I keep waiting to wake up. It's uh, one hell of a dream. <laughs> I have to say, obviously very impressive that you have won this many games, but you have had some incredible competitors that you've been up against. They've been fantastic. I mean, great games, They're really exciting to play, I'm sure to watch. And uh, yeah, and I feel so fortunate to have squeaked out so many close ones, so that's great. You've even said at the end of many of your games to some of your competitors, 
I hope that we see you in the second chance because you deserve a second chance. Great players, uh, so close. You know, usually within one question of uh, taking me out of here, and uh, that's got to count for something for sure. You've been really great with Final Jeopardy. To what do you attribute that vast knowledge, especially in those moments when you really need to come up with that correct response? It either pops into your head or it doesn't. You know, I've been lucky. Um, it just seems like I can focus in that moment. I maintain calm. And I think that's a big thing. I didn't panic at anything. If I saw a topic, I thought, you know, I'd start thinking, what do I know about that? And so a lot of times I was thinking about the answer before it even showed up. Lake Mead, the last one, was very much that. I was like, U.S. bodies of water, what's been in the news, what's happening lately? And that was one of the things that went through my head. So it, when it came up, I was all ready to write it down. Have you ever heard of Jeopardy! Blind Guesser? I have heard of that, yeah. <laughs> I haven't so, done it. But, so uh, you have done it, not maybe online, but you're doing it right life, here yeah. behind the winner's podium. That's interesting. Lake Mead just came to you. Yeah. What is it like to end one year as a Jeopardy! champion and know that you are heading into 2023? like starting out as a 12-game winner on I Jeopardy. I get to come back and keep on playing this lovely game, and uh, it's amazing. It's, it's a dream come true. It really is. And fellow Canadians, you shared a story about meeting Alex Trebek at a contestant audition. Who could have imagined you'd end up on the Alex Trebek stage a few years later as a champion? It's so surreal. And uh, I mean, even when I came out, it was, uh, I'd been in the contestant pool for about 15 months and I pretty much thought, okay, it's not going to happen for you, maybe next time. And then I got this phone call and uh, fortunately it didn't sound like anybody I knew. <laughs> so I didn't think anybody was punking me. <laughs> I didn't go, yeah, come on. Uh, yeah, but uh, wow. And then my heart went into my head and back down again and then, uh, it all became uh, real. Well, it is very real. You are a 12-game champion. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Enjoy your New Year's celebration, and we will see you in 2023. Thank you. Now I would like to uh, invite you all back to part two of my conversation with Sarah and Jimmy. Well, you've both transitioned now out of the, the Clue Crew is now permanently ensconced in, you know, the Jeopardy lore. But now you're both still at the show. Jimmy, you're the stage manager. Sarah, you are a producer. What does a typical day at Jeopardy look like now since you're not like running late for a flight, trying to catch a train, <laughs> wrangling a nurse shark? Busy. Well, it's just a whole <laughs> other set of skills. And as we mentioned earlier, Sarah and I had this deep conversation after yesterday. It was just so much going on. And I just really, to this day, have taken so much pride in my new role and really wanted to be the best that I can be. And I, I just am very fortunate that, uh, and again, wh where's Michael Davies, by the way? I thought he'd be here too uh, for me. Ah, yes. Well, he's <laughs> he, yeah, he, won't, he will not appear See, in the okay. pod, podcast. Oh, yeah, that's it. He can't be with Fuzzy. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that what it is? Well, it's in you. my contract, actually. I keep blaming oh, him, but it's in it's my contract. Oh, it's not Michael's fault. <laughs> <laughs> again, <laughs> theater of the mind. I yes. thought I was going to see Johnny and Michael, but, but I do mm -hmm. want to thank him in all, all seriousness. I mean, I've been able to stick around. Um, I take it uh, as, a, as a challenge each tape day to make sure that those folks who come to our show enjoy themselves. It's their first time. Therefore, uh, some of my jokes don't change, <laughs> but it's their first time, and I want them to have a good experience. And what's your, so what is that? Day, a tape day happens? What time are you here? What are you, what are you running through? Well, what typically you... at 945, we have a full rehearsal with our contestants. We run them through a full game board, and then after that, the audience is loaded, and then I take off my uh, rehearsal host hat, and I put on my audience warm-up hat, we welcome the audience. We let them know all of the things that we expect from them. It's a whole different experience if you come yeah. to the show. So I'd like to invite this huge Inside Jeopardy audience. If you've ever wanted to come and see our show live, I believe you can go to Jeopardy.com and, and get tickets. And let me know that uh, you heard this on the podcast. Yeah. I, I'd be more than happy to uh, say hello and, and just raise your hand. But please yeah. do come now that we have an audience. And you're the, as a stage, people might not know what a stage manager on a TV show does. You're the liaison for the director on the stage. Talk yeah. me through Sure. As a stage manager, I'm just sort of another set of eyes and ears for the director on stage. I also have communication with our producing desk. I'm, I'm working hand-in-hand -hand with Sarah. 
She lets me know after each commercial break if we're moving on, if we need to retoss, if there's a judgment that needs to be researched. I also work with the contestant department, making sure all of the contestants are happy. If uh, they have an issue, I'll let them, being the producers, know. Cueing our talent, letting them know when we're coming back from our breaks keeping the energy and the enthusiasm for the uh, the full half hour of the program. Sarah, what are your days like now that you're not getting pecked by penguins? Ah, oh, pecked by penguins. You know, every day is different. A tape day begins often with our pre-production meeting where we're going over all of the video clips and images that will go into that day's category, going over that with the director, the technical director, audio, just making sure everything's going to play smoothly and everyone knows the intention of the day. I work on writing the opens for Ken to say, and I have to say, Ken brilliantly delivers them without a teleprompter, so it's kind of a good balance. I write it for him, and then he does make it his own, but that's something that, you know, I do now. And then my role during the show, you know, Michael Davies says I'm the show producer, so during the show, I'm the voice to the talent. I communicate what the writers need me to communicate. I communicate what the booth needs me to communicate whether that is, you know, which clues we're going to pick up, if we need to retoss. I might get some great information to share with the host. Hey, we've had nine lead changes, or there were no incorrect responses in that round, or just little nuggets. You know how I love the word nuggets, Buzzy. Little nuggets that we can throw in to help make, you know, the game more interesting for the viewers. I love that 30 minutes when we're just in the show. I, I love it. I am just so in the zone. I think like a contestant is in the zone, I'm in the zone as a producer, just bouncing between correct and response, the category. It's just, it's it's a beautiful dance that thankfully we work with this spectacular team that knows exactly when to move, how to move, every nuance. And so to be a part of it as a producer now is, is pretty cool. And then on non-tape days, you know, I'm also a DGA segment director. So I go out and do the shoots with our celebrities, with our authors, with our contestants like yourself. I was able to do that fashion category with you. So that's a lot of that pre-production that we talked about with location agreements and clearances and getting the clues written and making sure they work for both the talent and for the show. And I work a lot with our development team on things like the podcast and (laughs) the Jeopardy honors and all of these. Wow. Great and you're a mom. <laughs> well, and I also was gonna I was gonna jump in because what people at home might not know, but you announce, uh, Jimmy, is that you actually announce the contestants at the top of the show. She does in the studio, and then Johnny Gilbert goes and does it in post. Yeah, so I'm fake Johnny Gilbert. It's just not a good comparison, <clears throat> but people are very kind to me. And then I do work with Johnny in post production to make sure that whatever pronunciations I've been given for the contestants, that he then pronounces them correctly when he does it for the real show. You know, Michael Davies has a lot of initiatives that he is working on and thankfully, you know, empowers me to help bring those to the next level. So there's a lot of creative and development stuff going on and you name it, we're doing it. Wow. (laughs) If I can take a step back out of the show, you are both part of Jeopardy's legacy. What does it mean to be part of the legacy? What does it mean to be so associated with an institution like Jeopardy in your daily life? You know, it is crazy, crazy, crazy. In my family, I am the most infamous, famous person there is. Everyone thinks because I work on Jeopardy, (laughs) I'm this, you know, smart guy. So I just keep my mouth shut at Thanksgiving. (laughs) (laughs) That's really, that's how it is. And whenever you're out, uh, we were told that it's like you're wearing the Jeopardy sign around you. You never know when someone might recognize you, and especially with the Clue Crew. You know, a lot of times people might not know my name, but they're like, hey, you're, you look familiar. You're that question guy. So just to represent the show that is an institution and that is a part of Americana will be something that I'll be most proud of the rest of my life. It's an honor. I mean, that's why we've been here for 21 years. Yeah. Why would we go somewhere else when we get to work for a show that we could be so proud of? A show that rewards knowledge and intelligence and brings families together and has lasted generations. Oh. I will forever be just so proud that I got to be a part of this and in any way. You know, yeah. Jimmy and I used to say, like, I'll sweep the floors. I yep. mean, we just, to be a part of this Jeopardy show You're preaching to the choir. Special. I mean, I'm grabbing You're coffees. You're part of this yeah. legacy. I'm grabbing coffees on uh, well, as during the coffee PA. <laughs> I mean, when we first started, our picture was in the TV guide. This yeah. is when they were printed. Sarah has a great story that <laughs> she and Sophia went <laughs> to the supermarket. Yeah, we and went to Ralph's. Bought out all of the TV guys. <laughs> we were pictured in the Je- Jeopardy Library with Alex. Yeah. This is unheard of. I, I mean, I grew up 
well, I was already in college, but a, a young man watching the show. My parents watched the show. And to think that we're now part of it. This job didn't exist when I was in college. I had no idea that this would be my life. So that's maybe a lesson for everyone. Live each day, you know, yeah. don't overthink everything. Let life happen. If you believe, good things will happen. Yeah, you can't even dream of a dream job that doesn't, doesn't exist, exist, but yet. you never know when it's going to come along. Mm. By the way, you look fabulous today. Thank you. Full oh, a disclosure. little fashion. Yeah, when you mentioned fashion, Fuzzy, your, your fashion is always top Thank notch. Thank you, Jimmy. To honor you today, I wanted to wear one of my Clue Crew suits from yes. the <laughs> suit that I wore at the Bush uh, Library, as a matter of oh. fact. But it doesn't fit right now. I'm so fat. <laughs> <laughs> so I opted for the Clue Crew t-shirt. That is, yeah, again, also a classic. trying to paint a picture, Jeopardy 2004 Clue Crew t-shirt, distressed, tastefully yes. distressed. Um, thank you guys so much. You know, we end each show with viewer questions, but for today's show, we uh, went out on social media and we had people send in their Clue Crew questions. So these are fan-generated questions. So I'm going to run you through them. Quarter Zip Quell asks, this seems like a dream job, but what is one of the least glamorous things you ever had to do on these trips? Oh, well, uh, farm animals, I think. Oh, uh, gosh. <laughs> had to milk a cow yes. one time. I'm a city boy. I <laughs> never milked a cow or sheared a sheep. We were on a dude branch once, which was somewhat glamorous. But anything with, with farm animals, one would think wasn't glamorous, but still a lot of fun. How about you, Sarah? Well, I think one of my least glamorous was when I was about 12 weeks pregnant and we were in the Baltic on a uh, Lindblad trip and we had to go into this open market that was a fish market and do clues about fish. And it was really hard to have that fish smell and oh, deliver yeah. clues while having terrible morning sickness. Oh, yeah, that was not so fun. Brutal. But, you know, um, I made it. Jumping off of that, Sam Richard asks, have you ever run into any kind of danger while filming your clues? You know, one time I, I remember, it wasn't me, it was actually my, my partner here, Sarah. <laughs> we were on a princess cruise and we spent a day parasailing. And uh, yeah. this was the first time that I ever saw the crew a bit concerned. Sarah took off beautifully and <laughs> then there might have been a sort of a wind issue and she hit the, the hit the water pretty Ooh. fiercely. I did, and our sound man, Russ Fisher, took out his mic. That was done for that one because I wasn't meant to go underwater. The whole right. plan was they'd Float, reel yeah. me back in, I'd yeah. be in the sky. Yeah, it took a little dunk. Another treacherous time. <laughs> I remember Kelly Miyahara and I were in South Africa, and we were doing safari clues with a den of lions, and we thought nothing of it. But they would put us on the hood of our safari vehicle, yeah. and then like you know, park us right near the den of lions. And, you know, just delivering clues. Yeah, this is but Sarah. Sarah thinks she's on the Jungle Cruise right, right now. Right, yeah. <laughs> I'm at Disney. What do you mean? Both of us talk about that after, like, how did we not even doubt that we should just crawl out on the hood of the vehicle and be within feet of wild animals, lions? But we were assured our guide had their gun ready if anything was to uh. go awry and... Do you think I would even be a part Jimmy, of that? Jimmy, no. I don't even no. think he'd travel to the country, let alone be in the safari vehicle. Tess Aleshire asks, if you could spend an off week in any city you visited for Jeopardy, where would it be? Probably, well, Rome, of course, but Venice. Also in Ireland. My wife is Irish, and that's all she ever wants right now. She wants to go to Dublin, so I guess it's on the air now. So we're going to Dublin! <laughs> you heard that, Kimmy. I don't know when. Jimmy just said it, Kimmy. You're going to Dublin. <laughs> that's a tough one. I mean... There are different ways I look at it now because it's where would I want to go back as a family. But right. I think it would have to be South Africa to yeah. go on safari with my kids. None of us will get on the hood of the car. But just yeah. to be there, I am so grateful for all the wildlife I've been able to see in its natural habitat, and not in like aquariums. It seems like Jimmy is thankful for all the wildlife you've gotten <laughs> yes, to see. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Well, thank you guys so much. This was such a pleasure. Sarah can tell you, Jimmy, that off air, I've been talking about how excited I am about this. Big fan of both of you. As people, as part of the show, thank you for your time and for sharing so much with me and with our audience. Thank Thanks, you. Buzzy. <laughs> All right, that wraps up today's show. We will be back next week for more gameplay discussion as Ray Lalonde goes for his 13th, lucky 13th lucky win. Lucky 13 in 2023. Let's see if he can do it. And we will be recapping Celebrity Jeopardy as well next week. So as always, join us. But in the meantime, make sure you subscribe, rate us, leave us a comment, share across social, and follow us at Jeopardy 
on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on TikTok. And we'll see you all next week. Bye-bye. Ken, what's that thing the kids say? You mean smash the like, subscribe, and bell button so you'll be the first to know when we upload more great videos? Yeah, that's it. Do that.